All right. Hi, I'm Daniel Knapp. I'm a sophomore, and today I'll be giving a brief in introduction to the 3D modeling software OpenSCAD. So OpenSCAD is a free and open source modeling software. And as I boasted in the introduction paragraph that I wrote for this Rad Lab, you can do 3D modeling without a mouse completely. So how is that accomplished? Well, all of the manipulation of the 3D object that you're modeling in OpenSCAD takes place on this left-hand window where you type the script that generates the object. We have this nice and large viewport where you can see what you're modeling, but all of the manipulations take place in the script, and there's no way you can change the object in the 3D viewing window. And this sort of simplicity in OpenSCAD really liberates you from all the complicated mouse movements and the endless keyboard shortcuts and hidden menus that you get in a lot of 3D modeling thing, uh, softwares. And it also helps you avoid certain pitfalls that make it difficult to produce models for 3D printing, um, which is the primary aim of OpenSCAD. So here's a, just a very quick example of this. This is a program called Blender, which is another free and open source modeling program, but it's a little bit more oriented toward um, art, artistic rendering and such. And as a result, we end up with problems like this. This is just the stock monkey model in Blender that comes with the plane and the cube and everything else. And if we look at inside of this, the eyes of the monkey are actually not connected to the rest of the head. They, they're still part of the same object, but the mesh is not connected, and that can cause problems when we're trying to 3D print objects. So often uh, models from 3D modeling programs like this have to go through a process of repairing before they can actually be uh, moved into a 3D printing software. The simplicity of OpenSCAD actually makes it difficult to uh, fall into pitfalls like this. and. Um, whereas it's easy, whereas inexperience leads to problems like this in other modeling programs, it actually takes experience in OpenSCAD to start running across these sorts of pitfalls. Here is the OpenSCAD cheat sheet, and uh, the link to this should be in the description. And oh, this that's right, I just remembered from description. S small side note: if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Red Lab Slack channel and I'll answer them as they pop up. There is a slight delay in the YouTube stream, so it might be a little bit until I see the question, but I'll try to answer them as I go. Let's end of the side note. So this is the OpenSCAD cheat sheet, and it contains pretty much the entirety of what you need to know for most modeling tasks in OpenSCAD. And we'll start by looking at specifically the 3D section in this cheat sheet. This is pretty much where most modeling starts. You can put cubes and spheres and cylinders and and um, mess with the parameters and get sort of the basic building blocks for your 3D object. These can then be transformed and so forth. And we'll, we're actually going to take a look at a simple example of what uh, modeling in OpenSCAD might look like. So I'm going to try to model a dumbbell here. And I'm going to start by just adding a sphere, which is one of the weights. Um, and it has a radius of 10. Um, we can put in more parameters if we if we want, but this is just the basic sphere. And the 10 represents 10 millimeters. So I just realized this as I was talking now, but um, 10 millimeters is a little bit small for a dumbbell, but it's just a dwarf sized dumbbell, I guess. Uh, anyways, that's another little perk of OpenSCAD is that you're always working in millimeters from the start. So, that, so that's nice too. The dollar $fn here, is just a variable that tells us what resolution the sphere is. Since after all, 3D models have to be made out of um, flat faces that are sort of joined together to make the smooth face, we can change this dollar $fn, dollar sign $fn variable to change the resolution. And 256 is rather high. With more complicated models, you'll start to run into uh, it taking a long time for the script to process. So maybe something like 32 or 64 might be more reasonable. But since this is a relatively simple example, I bumped it up to a high number. So now we're going to move this uh, sphere in the negative x direction by 20 millimeters. And then we're going to add another sphere. So these are our two dumbbell weights. And then we're going to connect them with a cylinder. And now this is sort of a great uh, place that 
highlights one of the strengths of OpenSCAD in that we're always modeling with solids when we're modeling in OpenSCAD. Um, when we're modeling the same sort of thing in Blender, we could add a, add a sphere and add a cylinder, but then if we actually look inside because the models in Blender are just these empty shells, we don't actually have a nice mesh. And we have the same sort of problem as we came across in the monkey eye example where um, these meshes are just sort of going through each other without properly um, intersecting and um, creating a hole on the inside of the sphere, as you might expect. Um, on the other hand, in OpenSCAD, um, when we were, um, we can use what's called a Boolean operation to add all of these solids together. And then when we export our 3D model, we actually have a nice continuous mesh that doesn't have this weird intersecting of faces going on. So uh, th this is, I exported this model here into Blender uh, with the $FN bump down from 256 because I wanted to save on time spent waiting for the model. And this is the result that we have where um, looking from the inside of the sphere, we indeed see this nice hole where uh, going to the cylinder that should be there to create a nice uh, mesh that's easy to 3D print. Um, OpenSCAD has three of these Boolean operations that make it so powerful. There's intersection as we see, oh, maybe we should pull out a laser pointer. Uh, let's see laser pointer. Here we go. So uh, there's the intersection where we can just select where two um, things intersect. We can do the union as we did earlier to add solids together. And then we can also take the difference where if we put one solid in the difference statement before another, it'll subtract the second one from the first one. So um, all of this sort of combined can give us some pretty complicated uh, shapes that we can start to work with. And I felt that sort of building models up from the ground is a little bit difficult to do in 20 minutes when I'm trying to show the power of OpenSCAD. So I decided to look at a couple of other examples. But before that, I want to talk about uh, another cool thing about OpenSCAD. Sorry, I didn't realize that my presentation went this way instead. Um, we can create modules in OpenSCAD. And um, doing this is another way that we can sort of use the strengths of programming to create complicated objects. So here I just shoved all the code to create a dumbbell into a module with some um, parameters that can be passed to it. And then now with that module defined, I can just create uh, the same dumbbell model by calling this uh, dumbbell module. Now. I can iterate over the module, so I can create a whole um, set of dumbbells of different weights and, and sizes. Um, and then I can we can do more. For example, recursion is possible in OpenSCAD, so you can do some cool stuff with fractals. This is a cool tree. It's one of the OpenSCAD demos that comes with the installation. Um, this is another uh, demo that comes with the installation, and it's just a menger sponge. Um, and now I'd like to look at some more uh, complicated examples. So these are, this is the gear bearing um, from Thingiverse. The link should be in the description again. And uh, this is one of the first things that I printed on my own 3D printer when I first started. So I have a little bit of a connection to it. Now, what's special about this gear bearing model is that it's highly parametric. So I can go into the OpenSCAD code and easily make big changes to the gear bearing without actually having to do any complicated modeling. So for an example, if you start, if you have access to only a bad 3D printer like I did, um, you might want to beef up the tolerance. So um, if I printed things this close together, they might get gummed up in the actual 3D printing process, but something like this has more tolerance and it might be a little bit rattly, but it's less likely to get gummed up when you're printing it. If I want less gears and more teeth, I can do that again. And then um, if you notice, the only thing that's changing between these is the numbers that are defined on the left-hand side of the screen. And just by changing a few numbers, I can make big changes in the actual model. And that's also another one of the strengths of OpenSCAD in that um, once we have the basic 
tools to generate a shape. We can just change a few numbers and make some pretty sweeping changes. And that's a functionality that you wouldn't find in other programs like uh, Blender, for instance. So now let's just take a quick look at how these complicated gears get built up from very simple beginnings in OpenSCAD. So in this case, the uh, author of the code um, starts with a half tooth. And this is just uh, the, the most of this tooth ends up actually being ignored. It's just this tip part that ends up being the half of the tooth of the gear. And I won't go into how this shape is actually created. It's done by actually defining specific points in the code. And there's a lot of thought that goes into uh, gear tooth profiles that I don't know very much about. So I won't get into that. But we start with a half tooth and then we mirror it around the axis to get a full tooth. And then once we have a full tooth, we can um, rotate and add many more teeth to get this sort of a, uh, the teeth for the gear. And then we just need to add a cylinder in the middle to connect everything together. And now we have like a, a wafer of a gear. This gear is then extruded with a twist to it. And then we can mirror that. And what we've done is we've gone from half a tooth all the way up to this full herringbone pattern of the tooth that keeps the gears together when they're in the gear bearing without uh, sliding out or anything. So from there, it's a simple matter of several translations um, and rotations. And then the outward cylinder is done by taking a cylinder and then taking the difference of uh, a here herringbone gear and the, and the cylinder to create this outer cylinder. And it's relatively simple from that point on. Here's the same user on Thingiverse, the site uh, where this gear bearing is posted, um, use the same code to create a much more complicated model. And this is a model of a automatic transmission that's been completely 3D printed. Now, um, it might be, it would be cool to see these, uh, this gear bearing in action. And, um, and unfortunately, I don't have the original that was confiscated from me from, by a school teacher because I was fidgeting with it in class, but um, I'll try to do the next best thing and show you an open sketch animation of what this gear bearing looks like when it's spinning. Um, so just a moment, I, that is the wrong SCAD file. I will, here is the correct SCAD file. So hopefully you're seeing the gear bearings and then um, these are set up so that there's a simple parameter uh, or variable phi that is dependent on this special variable dollar sign t. Um, and then when we actually use the animation functionality in OpenSCAD, this dollar sign t is incremented and we can actually see our model moving. So let me start the animation. So I just typed in the frames per second. In this case, I only did three frames per second since uh, it takes a little bit for the model to get a render. So it's, it's not a very, it's not an amazing uh, frame rate, but you can get an idea for how the gear bearing looks when it's actually um, in action. Now, there are a couple of other cool animations that um, I can show you. Here's one. This is going to be another three frames per second animation. And this is a continuous velocity joint. This is actually an open sketch model that I found on Wikipedia. Um, someone used it on the Wikipedia page for continuous velocity joints. And apparently what's special about this joint is that the angle, unlike a universal joint, the angle between the two shafts can change without the relative rotational velocity of the shafts changing. So that's pretty cool. And then finally, there's one more cool animation example. Um, uh, all right, let me find the correct one. Here we are. So this one, let's go 16 frames per second. Um, and it's off. And this one shows how two arms can be uh, configured to follow some path. And what's special about uh, this animation is that 
Um, let's decrease the number of steps so that it goes a lot faster. Um, what's cool is that it uses a special algorithm to, de to determine the angles of the arms so that they never cross over each other or anything. So um, uh, OpenSCAD has some cool animation potential. Maybe you won't get the smoothest or most artistic animations, but um, you will you will get sort of a, it is a simple way to do these sort of mechanical um, animations. All right, um, and then a final sort of niche where OpenSCAD is very cool to work with is in math. So this is an example uh, that I found on GitHub and it involves taking this um, simple polar plot and then extruding it while rotating it. So it's kind of an, a solid of revolution, except there's like an extra revolution added while it's being extruded. Um, and it, it's relatively easy in OpenSCAD to do cool math things like this, especially if you already have the uh, bare bones of the code to do the plotting and all you have to do is type in the equations. So in this case, this is um, part of the code, sort of the heart of the code that uh, generates this. And what we're looking at here is actually defining the individual points in the uh, in the donut uh, based on the formula uh, or a formula that was put in ahead of time. So this is sort of where being the expertise in OpenSCAD can lead you into pitfalls. As I mentioned earlier in the monkey eyes example, um, the, there was a problem with the eyes not being connected to the rest of the mesh. And you can end up doing weird things depending on the order that you define the points or um, defining weird points that can't connect very well to other points and stuff. So if you push OpenSCAD far enough, you can end up causing problems. But for the most part, unless you're actually defining the individual points in your model, you're pretty safe. Here's another cool example um, of just a uh, simple 3D plot that can be done in OpenSCAD. And again, there, there are other problem, programs that are specifically designed for these sort of mathematical um, plots and such. But if you want to 3D print a 3D uh, mathematical function or something, OpenSCAD is a really easy way where you can plot something on your screen and then immediately export it as an STL file for 3D printing. Finally, um, I'd like to highlight one last strength of OpenSCAD, which is that you can have access to libraries. So just like Python has a bunch of libraries that different people have written, OpenSCAD has its own little array of libraries produced by the OpenSCAD community, and I'd like to introduce a couple. So this first, NopSCADlib, is for um, modeling machines in OpenSCAD, and it has just an endless array of different uh, standard parts and electronic components that you can uh, bring into your OpenSCAD uh, project to make sure that the part you're printing is compatible. Here's another one, .scad is just a huge uh, library of different um, sort of mathematically oriented, I guess, uh, OpenSCAD functions. And it, and it just has all kinds of extrusions or, I don't know, I'm, or like Voronoi um, noise generation or all, all kinds of cool little things that you might want and they would be difficult to code on your own, but they're already available um, in the dot sketch. So I recommend checking that out as well. And then uh, just to wrap up the presentation, I'd like to mention a couple of downsides to OpenSCAD. It's not all perfect. Uh, for instance, if you're into sculpting, um, you know, creating like a bust of someone or something, OpenSCAD is not going to be a very nice way to do it. Um, in those cases, something like Blender would actually be a lot better just because it has inbuilt support for all this more artistic stuff. So that's a place where OpenSCAD might fail you. Um, rendering also tends to be slow. So once you have your code written, you, um, you can press F5 to visualize it in the viewport, but you need to render it pressing F6 to actually get the STL file out. And that can take a long time. So um, if you have a very complicated uh, model in OpenSCAD, that, has, that is also something that you need to take care to 
uh, factor in. Um, OpenScan also exports, uh, tends to create a lot of triangles in the mesh, which isn't usually a problem, except for if you want to do something in OpenScan and then export it to Blender and then sculpt it, for instance. In general, um, it's said that uh, triangular meshes don't deform very well. You want uh, uh, four-sided polygon meshes for stuff like sculpting or animating in Blender. So um, OpenScan doesn't, doesn't really prepare you very well for that. Um, if you're very worried about the topology of your model, um, and then the last two are sort of related, I guess, to the second point. Um, OpenSCAD is prone to crashes. Um, you're inevitably going to accidentally crash OpenSCAD with a slightly complicated model um, when you're rendering it. And then there's also infrequent updates because the OpenSCAD community isn't as big as some of the other open source communities out there. But uh, if you just keep these uh, downsides in mind, OpenSCAD is a great tool for 3D modeling, and um, I'm sure it will greatly facilitate your 3D printing if you pick it up. Thanks for listening, and let's see, do I have any questions in the Red Lab Slack? Uh, oh no, they never returned it back to you? Yes! Um, so the question is whether I got the 3D printed gear bearing back. And the answer is no. I asked for it at the end of the year, and the math teacher informed me that she'd lost it. So I'm still very miffed about that. But yeah. Uh, awesome animation, Forbidden Donut. What are some of the problems you've encountered with more complex models? Yeah. Um, rendering time, crashes are sort of big ones. And then um, just in general, the viewport isn't very optimized. So if you have a complex model and then you're trying to uh, change the angle of view or something, it can be a little bit clunky that way. So yeah, I'd say the, the main problems with more complex models are just that the program itself is slow, but I'm sure as it gets updated and slowly honed, that'll get better as well. Uh, uh, do you have any other of your projects to share also do you know anything about python scripting uh yeah so um i don't have a, a big project on the go i did stuff like um i did a lot of 3d uh, modeling in OpenSCAD for just really mundane sort of mechanical stuff like um yeah i, I don't know if i can pull up a picture immediately but there was a pendulum stand. Let's see. Um, Brendan, if I pull up like, okay, I'll, I'll try to um, see if I can pull up a picture or something of something that I did with OpenSCAD. Yeah. Um, sorry. I'm navigating my incredibly uh, messy file system. Um, I made a pendulum stand. Let's see. Nope, it's not the correct document. Um, yeah, I'm. So I, I had these pipes that were laying around and I, yeah, I'm trying to find the correct document. Sorry. Um, all right. So let me change my share to Microsoft Word. So uh, this is, uh, physics experiment that I did. Oh, this might be fun. Um, so yeah, I actually printed a lot of, so it was an experiment to measure um, the acceleration of gravity. So I did a lot of stuff with dropping balls and pendulums. Um, this isn't a very compelling OpenSCAD model, but uh, I modeled it, it. I modeled this sphere in OpenSCAD. I actually had to model two halves and then glue them together. Um, 
so that because you can't just easily print a sphere by itself in the 3D printer, this is, let's see. Okay, so this is the actual uh, thing that I built. And all of these individual parts were modeled in OpenSCAD in blue. So I have these pipes with creating like a stand for the pendulum. And then um, I have these uh, individual friction um, fitted uh, plastic fittings that connect the pipes. And then OpenSCAD was really good for that, not only because you can easily bore holes and stuff, but you can also just define a tolerance variable. Then you put in the diameter of the pipe and then you can always uh, try a print. And then if it's too tight or if it's too loose, you can just tweak the tolerance variable and uh, get the updated tolerances for all your parts, um, stuff like that. Yeah, I don't necessarily have a super complicated project that I use that I used advanced functionality in OpenSCAD uh, for, but this is some of the stuff. This is an example of what I've worked on. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Python scripting that Rhino and Blender support. Yeah, I've read about Python scripting. I haven't actually touched on t or actually messed with it. So I couldn't say, but um, the impression that I get is that it's much easier to just start writing scripts in OpenSCAD than to um, force yourself to use the Python scripting in Blender. But I could be wrong. It could be that Python scripting in Blender is a lot easy. The, the other problem is I haven't done too much Blender, especially since the big user interface update. So since then, it could be a lot easier to do. So that's another thing to consider. Uh, what language do you think OpenSCAD's syntax is most similar to? Um, in terms of general syntax, it's kind of close to like C, C Sharp or Java. Um, in that you have these brackets that sort of contain anything instead of just the white space that you use in Python. Um, it also reminds me a little bit of like MATLAB, the way you do for loops in OpenSCAD, for instance. Let's see if I can pull up an easy example. Um, here we go. So this is back to the gear bearing. And then when we're actually creating the a gear, when we're rotating all the teeth around to get all the teeth we want, there's a for loop in here. Um, I can find it. So it's in the gear 2D. OK, so for an example, the way the for loop is done with this um, brackets and one Two dots, I forgot what you call those. Um, colons, yeah, with the colon and the um, that, that sort of thing is uh, kind of similar to MATLAB. And then you can also do um, more, co more complicated stuff like for um, i equals zero, increment 0 0.1 to 10, um, stuff like that. So if you want a you know, finer for a loop or something, you can do stuff like that too. So stuff like that reminds me a little bit of MATLAB. But yeah, I think in general, yeah, with the semicolons at the end of lines as well, it's a very C sharp or Java-esque syntax. So not that difficult to learn, I don't think. Yeah, okay, so the question is, um, what resource is good for people starting out? How, where, where would you want to start with OpenSCAD? And um, that's actually a little bit of a blindsight. <laughs> I should have thought about this when I was preparing the presentation. Uh, to be honest, it's not a very complicated thing per se. I think. I, I didn't really follow a specific tutorial or anything. You can, if you want a part, you can start messing with it um, 
add a cylinder and then cut out a hole somewhere. And then if you want to do something a little bit more complicated, you can Google it and see what other people have done. There's, um, there are a lot of forums and such that talk about it. So there's a lot of resources that way. I know there's a, there are also a lot of YouTube tutorials um, that'll give you the, the bare bones basics. So um, that might be a good place to start too, but I actually haven't look th looked through them. So I can't recommend anything specific. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so thanks for coming. Um, thanks for listening to my presentation and make sure to check out the Red Labs um, coming up next week. And um, after that as well, there's a lot of cool Red Labs coming up. So yeah, uh, see you there.